Well, good morning, and welcome to our church service at the Bath Church of the New Jerusalem. I'm, as you know, and you may not know, Reuben Bell, the pastor here. I'm happy to have you, and I'm happy to have the people out there, some whom I know and some I don't, which is really kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to explore something today that I'm going to continue with in the next probably two weeks, at least one week. Um, it's the idea of judging, and uh, that's, a, that's something that most ministers do, won't touch with, an 11-foot pole, because judging is judging, and um, well, I'll get into it with you. It's a perilous subject. It's not necessarily perilous. We have clear teachings from the Lord himself on judging. We have very clear teachings from the teachings of our church on judging, judgment, and the Jewish mystics have given us some unbelievable insight into judgment with mercy. And I'm going to explore that next time. But the point is, judgment, we're going to talk about it. We judge every day. As long as you know the facts on something and you see that thing, you judge it whether you know it or not. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. And uh, in fact, it isn't a bad thing. It's only bad if we do it wrong. And it's done wrong a lot. So we'll talk about that today and uh, see where we get. And then I plan to continue the topic a little further because uh, there are more places to go. And I'll give you a hint. We're going to end up, you ready for this? Might be two weeks, with beauty. Just tuck that under your wing and we'll talk about that later. Rise, please, for the opening of the word. If you abide in my word, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now our recitation this morning is something we talk a lot about, but we hardly ever read. So I thought, well, let's just pull out all the stops and read the Ten Commandments. The three versions in our book, from long and actual literal to a little shorter to a little shorter, we're going to use the one on the bottom. It's the, it's the good stuff from the Ten Commandments. We'll, and we'll read this and say this together. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before my face. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything else that is your neighbor's. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, we ask you to give us understanding and strength that we may walk confidently in your ways. Give us faith and trust in the wisdom of your providence. Enlighten us from your word that at every crossroad of life we may see to choose the better way. When doubts arise, help us to open our hearts in prayer to you, that you may lift up the light of your countenance upon us and give us peace, perfect peace. Amen. And now we pray the prayer that the Lord himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We pray a prayer now for our own Bath Church, saying together, Heavenly Father, Make this church of ours, we pray, a place where men and women of all conditions 
may come face to face with you and know firsthand your love, truth, and power. Bless this church, O Lord, in all its activities. Renew its vitality. Strengthen its faith and reliance on you alone. Fill our lives with the single motive of serving you and our neighbors, making the Bath New Church a center of spiritual inspiration for the community all around. Make us a portal for the New Jerusalem that is even now coming in to the world. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord. It is written first in Psalms, Psalm 119, portions of Psalm 119. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. You are good, and you do good. Teach me your statutes. I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Next, from Matthew chapter 7, one we've heard, everybody loves to spout, judge not, lest you not be judged. For with that judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your eye. Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The lot in that passage right there. From John chapter 7, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Okay. Further in John's gospel, the Lord's talking to his disciples. He says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now, here's the passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's a letter from Paul, the Apostle Paul, to the people in Corinth. Now, they were people of a new church. He had, just, he had just settled this church. They were beginners. He was teaching them how to live the spiritual life. It was not an easy thing. He says to them, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone <clears throat> who claims to be a brother or a sister. That means within that little church he was planting, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, slanderer, a drunken, a drunkard, a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Put away from yourselves the evil person. We'll have to kind of talk about that. A passage from the writings for the new church, Love and Marriage, Conjugal Love is the name of it, uh, number 523. The Lord says, judge not that you be not judged. That's in Matthew. In no way can this be taken to be judgment of anyone's moral and civil life in the world, but judgment of someone's spiritual and heavenly life. Who does not see that if judging the moral life of people we live with in the world were not allowed, society, society would collapse? What would society be without public justice and without each person's own judgment of another? By judging what the inner mind or soul in them is like, that is, what their spiritual condition is like, and therefore what happened to them after death, of this no one is permitted to judge, because it is known to the Lord alone. Nor does the Lord reveal it until after death, in order that everyone may do what they do in freedom, and that good or evil may consequently be from them and so in them, and the person thus live their own life and be their own person to eternity. So he's telling us clearly that passage, judge not lest you be judged, that I read, and it's a long passage. He says they're talking about 
the internal sense, which means judging people's spiritual life. We're not to do that. He said, well, we can judge their public life for sure. Okay, we'll get into that. And lastly, from the true Christian religion, number 226, in the Gospels of Matthew and in Luke, the Lord says, do not judge so that you are not judged. With whatever judgment you judge, so you will be judged. Now we're revisiting that passage. Without the teachings of the church, one might be led to conclude that we must not judge wicked people to be wicked. That these teachings tell us that it is lawful to judge so long as we do so righteously. For the Lord says, judge with righteous judgment. And this righteously business is tough. We're going to talk about it. Amen. Here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of the Lord and keep it. pray. We pray for the sick. Grant them health, Lord, and raise them up from their sickness, and let them have perfect health of body and soul. For you are the Savior and benefactor. You are Lord and King of all. Lord, we come to you as we do each week, a group of friends, a group of believers. And there are those among us and those associated with us who are in a special need of your attention at this time. You know them. We're going to raise them up to you and ask that you bring your healing presence, healing in whatever form you so choose. Remember Ken this morning, 
and Jacob and Carol. Remember Lily and Laurie and Ray. Remember Deb and her mother Jerry. Remember Deborah and Charlotte. And remember Tristan this morning. Remember Aspen and Thomas, that young man that we've asked you to see about before, in great need of your help. Remember Angela and Suzanne and Keith. And there are others, Lord, and you know them. We pray also today for those who are, in, who are taking care of those who are in such need. Sick, injured, end of life. Go to those caregivers and give them strength and patience and a sense of duty. Amen. And now each one of us comes to you in the quiet of our heart to speak with you about things that only we might know. Amen. Now I pray a prayer, a prayer for healing for the whole world. God of wholeness, God of healing, envelop all the world with wholeness and well-being. Heal us, we pray, in body and soul. Let all the elements of our bodies work together in perfect symmetry and harmony. Remove every trace of illness, every hint of infirmity, any threat of contagion, Send us the healing which you alone can bring. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Have you ever been in a situation at work or maybe a town meeting, a social gathering, a soccer game, when you began to feel that you didn't really share the prevailing attitude about some social matter that was being discussed? Did you ever get the feeling that you might be the only one there who didn't agree with the prevailing opinion? And worse yet, that your reservations were not based on just opinion, but on your religious beliefs? What a sinking feeling. During that awkward interval, what uh, that seemed to call for some comment from you too. What if someone asked what you thought? Did it ever happen to you? Well, it happens to me a lot. I bet it happens to you too. You see, ignorance is bliss. It is bliss. No doctrine, no worries, no beliefs, no problem. But once you've seen the light of truth, that's called repentance, incidentally. And once you have decided to follow where that light leaves, leads, that's called reformation, then you can never go back to the bliss of not knowing about good and evil, truth and falsity, right and wrong. You can't do it. Sorry. Like it or not, you are called forevermore to judge between the two. Now, don't get me wrong. This is a good thing. Don't think of it as a burden. I think people do. Forget that. There is a, there's the kingdom of heaven in that. But no one ever said that getting to the kingdom of heaven was easy. Now, we live in a toxic age of political correctness. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Remember, that, remember when that phrase first hit the street? Political correctness. It wasn't that long ago. But in a short period of cultural development, what began as an almost comical adherence to a rigid social party line has gained momentum and mainstream status as the mandated acceptance of whatever we are told is good and true. And you know, it was the serpent in the Garden of Eden who started this business of humans choosing their own good and truth. That goes way back, so this is nothing new. But it certainly has a new face in this brave new world that we're living in. A generation of young adults raised on this new authority are taking their place in the world. 
And suddenly, what a person believes is no longer important or even acceptable if it goes against the prevailing narrative. Now, who sets this narrative that we are compelled to accept? It really doesn't matter. That's a discussion for the classroom or maybe the editorial page. Not here. What matters is, my, is that my beliefs do not matter if they do not match. What matters is that beliefs based on divine truth, at our word, religion, and not human ingenuity, no longer carry much freight with most folks. And that is scary. So who am I to judge? That's the catchphrase of this new social consciousness. Judgmental, as I'm sure you would agree, is a pejorative, pejorative term in modern use. It's so judgmental, huh? We're all taught by our culture in a hundred subtle ways to never judge a person in any way. Government, schools, surprising number of churches teach this lesson every day. Now the case with churches is this. There is a false dichotomy that says there are only two possibilities concerning moral judgment. First possibility, anything goes relativism that many mainstream churches have adopted. Okay, that's fine, anything goes. And the other is the harsh intolerance of fundamentalism. Now I ask you, what caring person would choose intolerance? So our only choice is A, not B. You get the trap? Now I ask you, who would call, who would, who would choose intolerance? A false dichotomy is an effective fallacy of logic. It presents only two solutions to a problem. They're opposite in extremes, and it offers one of these as the only really logical option. It's an old trick, and it is old because it works. You see it everywhere you go. I do it myself sometimes without meaning to. It's just so easy. Who am I to judge when judgment of any kind by this false dichotomy is harsh and cruel? Beware false dichotomies. They are everywhere, and they will lead you astray every time. So let's say that in our culture, judgment is a negative thing. Okay, but what about this righteousness that we've talked about? To most people, the word righteous is also not such a great term. It means pious. It means holier than thou, nose in the air, Pharisees are, are, are that way. Certainly not something you'd want to be, right? No. This is another problem that a person who tries to lead the spiritual life must deal with every day. And yet our new church, which is not particularly repressive, it's wonderfully not repressive, it lays out clear limits for appropriate behaviors based on clear biblical definitions and good of good and truth, evil and falsity. We read aloud the clearest of these today, the good old Ten Commandments. Now, are they still valid in this enlightened age? Mm. Are there gray areas between those Ten Commandments? Well, sure, but not really as many as we'd like to think. The trouble is not the gray areas in doctrine, the teachings of our church, but in what to do about them. The question is how to live a life according to spiritual truths, which, by the way, is the definition of righteousness, living a life according to spiritual truths. You do that, you're righteous. Simple as that. Here's how the writings for the new church define it. No one can be called righteous or just unless they live according to truths. For in the natural sense, everyone is called righteous who lives well according to civil and moral laws. But in the spiritual sense, a person is righteous who lives well according to the divine laws. And the divine laws are truths from the word. The person who thinks they are righteous, consequently in the good of life, without the truths according to which they should live, is much deceived. For this person cannot be reformed and regenerated, consequently become good, except by truths and by a life according to them. So the two kinds of righteousness, there's, there's the natural kind, which means you follow all the laws and you'll be good and you don't steal and you're, you put on a happy face. You might even come to church every week. But he says that's not really righteousness. Righteousness is when you live according to spiritual truth. It's a different kind. It can be both. Should be. 
So righteousness does not mean pious or holier than thou. It doesn't mean harsh or punitive either. And that's really important. That would be the other choice in this false dichotomy. Righteousness means living in accordance with not just civil and moral law, and these change with the seasons, but in accordance to the divine law as well. And remember, once you've acknowledged the divine law, there's no going back to the blissful life of ignorance.